And I loved watching your live the other night um, with Unconditional Parenting. You're so entertaining. I'm so excited. Yeah, that was really fun. It's, I mean, these are topics I'm super passionate about. So I'm so happy when I get the chance to be on here and interact with people and um, share some of my knowledge and hear some of yours. I don't know how much knowledge I have. I have experience. Experience. And everyone on here has experience turns into knowledge and knowledge turns into experience hopefully um and everyone on here just even the questions that people send um are, are super helpful they get me mm -hmm. thinking definitely um i was rambling for a bit um, oh you were what happened i i didn't see your live pop up and i was like oh yeah i'm waiting I, don't know, I was talking about my closet perfectionism for about 10 minutes closet perfectionism i didn't really know that i was a perfectionist <laughs> oh, we're closeted in okay so um yeah I figured it out after a while but and then you know and, and I showed um the gifts of imperfection mm. um, you know that was that's like basically the basis for the for all of Brene's stuff like I, I feel like yeah. if you've read that you've like read all, all of them. yes did you watch her her Netflix uh special yet mm -mm. oh my gosh I'm in the did middle of it and it's like amazing really oh yeah. Uh, uh, yeah it's like with a lot of presenters uh you see the, their things and it's like okay it's the same thing every time and with her she talks about a couple of topics and then every time there's just so much more um so yeah oh i can't wait uh, yeah yeah highly recommend okay so so anyway so um so i i kind of gave like a brief overview of of like what I know of your background, but do you mm -hmm. want to kind of fill everybody in? Um, what did you already say? I said that you, well, uh, I said that you um, started the deep dive course. Is that accurate? You oh, that's that? actually starting this, this week. So people, by the way, I'm tempted to give you all a promo. Um, people who want to join, parents who want to join in Lakewood, there still are some spots. You know, I'm noticing that after, I think it's after Pesach, people are kind of, finding it really difficult to spend money right now on on courses and stuff like that. Um, so if people are wanting, I can just put out a promo for people watching tonight. Um, it's just to make it a little bit more accessible so that people can join. I understand it is through Paystaff, like people spend a lot of money and invest in new things and in new appliances and new stuff. And afterwards, it's like, oh my gosh, you know? Um, so yeah, the deep dive course is starting this week. There still are spots available in Lakewood. So if people are interested, they can message me and um, we'll get them in. So we'll them. Can, can you give a, like a brief overview about like what that is? And sure. What? So sure. So everything we'll be talking about today um, about shame and guilt and all of that. Now, the first time that the two that Project Proactive and myself started talking about, you know, this could be a great topic for a live was when um, Blimey Heller posted something that came up in the course where people, um, parents, obviously I can't share any content because it's a therapeutic environment, but people were relating a lot to each other around the fact that they feel so much shame in certain areas of parenting, in areas where they find themselves making mistakes again and again. Um, and they were noticing that as much as they tried to use shame to kind of help them or motivate them, it just wasn't working. Um, and then like what I said there was that any change that's derived from shame never ever works long-term. Um, and that's just one of the themes that come up in the course where we, we talk about these big themes that people struggle with. Like they, they might go to a lecture and, and take in some information about parenting or relationships or food. Like these are some of the other areas of um, group work that I do and they're like I have all the information in my head and for some reason I am not able to apply it like something's getting in the way um, shame is one of them and there are more but what we do there in the deep dive it's not me uh, lecturing or talking to you or just you know sharing information because a lot of you have that you you know what you want to do and what you're trying to do but there's something getting in the way so in that course what we do is we look at the stuff getting in the way um, so it's more therapeutic than educational. Um, it's very valuable. I mean, I'm the one leading the group, but I leave inspired every single time. Um, it's a weekly group, so it's just amazing. Um, 
And the topic of shame versus guilt ties in a lot when it comes to parenting. But even for people on here who are not parents, this is something that comes up for every single person. Because um, it's just, it's a very deep rooted idea, shame versus guilt. So it's, it's there. For sure. For sure. Um, like, I, uh, I was telling you that, that uh, when we talked briefly before, <laughs> that, that I, I really all these years I thought like that I felt guilty all the time. Like I was always feeling like yeah. guilty about this and guilty about yep. that. And yep. what, you know, I don't want to hurt this person's feelings. And I, yeah. and, and like, so it was, it's just like a state of confusion a little bit. Yes. Like, like what, um, and I didn't really understand shame, like the, where shame was rooted. It, like I, I, you know, I, if somebody said, Oh, do you feel shame about anything? I'd be like, no, I don't feel like, what, what do I have to be shameful about? Right. But, so what can you explain what the difference between shame and guilt is? Sure. So there are many ways, different ways to conceptualize the difference. I'm going to go with one. And then I'd love to hear from you if you have something else to kind of add to that. Um, but first, I just want to validate this reality for a lot of people that a lot of people do not know the difference between shame and guilt. A lot of the questions that I got was people asking like, what do you mean shame versus guilt? Aren't they the same thing? Like a lot of people were like, I, you know, I'd love to join the live, I'm excited, but I don't get it. Like, aren't they the same thing? Um, so this is part of, hi Sarah. So this is part of what we um, want to bring out here. Like, yes, they are two different things. So one way that is like in one sentence to kind of differentiate the two of them, when you experience shame, you experience it as an attack on yourself, right? It's like you did something and then the shame that follows, you did something, thought something, whatever it is, the shame that you feel is I, the person, am bad, I am terrible, I am dirty, I am stupid. Like it's just a lot of stuff focused on the person. Whereas guilt is this gentle little ding, 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 like a little light that says, hey, what I did right now doesn't fully align with my values. Hmm, could I have done something differently? It's very gentle. It asks a question. Whereas shame is this like, this attack. It just, it just kind of like, in, it, it just comes over you. People describe it as like a wave of sand, you know, and uh, sand that's stuck in some kind of gooey mess and it just go, it, it just comes all over you. And then it's like, you're stuck in a gooey, sandy, heavy mess. There's not much you can do from there. So the shame just kind of rolls and rolls and rolls. And it, you can stay there for, I mean, a long time. Is that kind of like the feedback loop? Ooh, say more about that question and how you, tell me more. So did you read the, uh, the book that I'm not going to say Which on the live? Because I don't say that word, but the subtle <laughs> art <laughs> of... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah. So you don't say that word. <laughs> it's a great book. Oh my god! Without saying the word, Woo. he's um, very, very good. Um, yes, yes. So yes. it's like that feedback loop from exactly. hell that Mark Manson talks about. Is yes, like you just that's that's rooted in shame. Absolutely, absolutely. Because the feedback loop, and for people who don't know what it's about, um, Mark Manson, Mason? Manson. Manson. It's a great book. Um, we're not saying the name, we're respecting the space, but it's a very <laughs> good book. Um, there, I don't remember the exact context of what he says. It's about cr the creative process um, and how sometimes you get stuck in a loop of like a, a loop that doesn't allow you to do what you want to do to reach a goal that you've set for yourself. And it's a loop that kind of gives you more attacks on yourself and another attack and another attack and another attack and you're kind of stuck in it. Now, if it was guilt, it wouldn't be an attack, it would be a question. Like for example, if you weren't able to reach a certain goal by whatever you set for yourself, it'd be like, oh, I wonder what was getting in the way for me to reach this goal. What are some other things that I can put in place for myself for the next time so that I am able to reach the goal so it's guilt a uh, guilt i see it as it's a pretty heavy emotion and feeling like we don't like feeling that we did something wrong and it's not the most comfortable experience to acknowledge that we may have to apologize to someone we may have to apologize to ourselves that we have to take some corrective action it's not the most comfortable experience but it's not it doesn't feel like an attack it, it feels okay it feels okay now 
there may be people who don't have an experience of guilt that for for many reasons there are many reasons why but there are a lot of people who who feel shame so much more than guilt it's it's almost like guilt doesn't really know how to operate within them this may be because maybe as you know as they were growing up they were never given an opportunity like they were never told maybe as kids when they did something wrong that oh you know let's think of something wrong that a kid can do i mean kids are so young like what what something a simple example like they, they they, they, they were, the okay, they were playing ball. This is not even wrong. I mean, this is a human thing. It's, it can happen. They were playing ball and they threw it and, and a window, um, you know, got a window shattered. Okay. Now, if the parent would respond um, really angrily, oh, what did you do? Oh, look at you. You're so clumsy. Oh, you are so in and listen, right? It's you are so clumsy. You are, again, you did it again. Oh, you, and it's you. And, and it's just, there's so much shame. And the kid is feeling like, you know, yeah, I really didn't want to do it. But yeah, I guess that means I'm bad. So the kid starts, and this is just a simple example. And if the kid gets this feedback every time they do something that has maybe an undesirable effect, um, I'm not even going to say the word wrong. Like, it's not about doing something wrong. It's about they did something that, you know, could happen anytime. They made a mistake. And if they are faced with a just an attack of so much shame, they learn that this is the response. And the next time when they throw a ball and, and it breaks a window, they won't need the parent to shame them. The shame will happen internally. And guess what? Our bodies are really adaptive. So, the like, we will learn that when other when we do other things that are wrong we're also probably terrible and horrible and 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 disgusting clumsy people right and so this becomes our inner dialogue now on the other hand if the kid threw the ball window shattered and the parent says oh my gosh you know we just installed this window and and they're thinking to themselves you know it does cost a lot of money and uh, like let's say let's say that was the the you know that was why it bothered them so much or whatever it is and they just tell the kid, oh, you were playing ball and then it broke. And then they have a conversation about responsibility and they have a conversation about how um, the child can maybe in some age appropriate way help make up for it. You know, the child starts getting an internal dialogue of, oh, oh, yeah, I made a mistake and, and it's okay. And mommy's not stopping to love me and there's a way to repair it. And oh, okay. And guess what? The next time they make a mistake, they'll be fine in the sense that it won't just be an attack of like, mm, oh, what did I do? It's more like, oh, okay, well, I guess now I made a mistake. I guess I need to apologize or help repair it or think about how I can do things differently. And then that becomes their inner dialogue. Now, again, it doesn't mean that a kid who was shamed once will always have a shaming inner dialogue. It doesn't mean that a child who was responded to well will never feel shame, right? But this is one way in which our shame versus guilt dialogue starts being created, and it happens when we're teeny, teeny, tiny. So if at this stage in life, let's say you're an adult, and you feel like simple things that people, you know, frequently, you know, make a mistake in or mess up, that you just can't handle it. Like there's just so much shame that you get attacked with from within. It, it might be interesting to wonder about what was your experience in the past when you were a tiny human, right? A little kid looking up at your parent or wh whoever the caretaker was. And what would happen if you made a mistake? Would there someone be there to repair it with you? Would it be safe to tell someone that you made a mistake? Uh, these are just some questions that can help understand where the shame, where the immediacy of the shame response may have its roots. Um, and again, like nonverbal, like 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 parents. Or, oh my gosh! Or yes. That set ridiculously high standards for themselves, mm -hmm. and you don't see what's going on behind the scenes. Amazing question. Like, right, like or if you go to a school that has yes really yes. unattainable like unsustainable rules mm -hmm. for... oh yes absolutely now this is like a great point like 
many things that you said. I'm like, oh, so many things to say. Oh. So first about the nonverbal. Yes, yes, a million times yes. The shame response from a parent to a child or a teacher to a student, which I have a great story about teachers to students. Um, and I think this could be a great experiential thing for everyone to try. But right here on the live, I'll tell you that in a minute. But it doesn't have to be verbal. It doesn't. If a parent has a nonverbal shameful response to what a child was doing or a teacher has this, you know, just gives a look or just the energy shifts, guess what? We pick up on that as little kids. And if you're the adult right now and you're doing that to a kid and you think, oh, well, I didn't say anything. Mm. The kid does not need you to say anything for them to understand what you are putting out there. And they put the words to it internally. You don't have to say the words. They'll match whatever appropriate words you're not saying, but you're giving out there. They'll match it. Kids are smart. So yes, it doesn't have to be verbal at all. And then yes, it could also be this, this um, almost like institutional. Like for example, if there's a school that sets unsustainable rules, I love that term unsustainable rules if you are a school principal leader anyone who's here like listen to this if there are rules in place that are not sustainable for a child to continue doing and being a part of you are setting them up for failure especially if the response to them breaking a rule is something shaming right sending them out of the class you know how sh i mean Anyone here who has experienced that knows how shaming it is to just be sent out of the classroom. And yes, we, we cover it up. Ha ha, I didn't want to be here anyway. Or, ha, ah, see, you're sending me out. I'm going to have fun in the hallways. But it's so shaming. Like, for a child just to be a child and then there's an unsustainable rule in place and then they're kind of just sent out, it's deeply shaming. And we carry that with us. Um, and a lot of times in, in uh, the educational lessons as well, there's very often this idea that bringing shame into it. So I'll share a story. Um, and then I'll, then I'll give you a little exercise to do. So there was this teacher that I had, and I was probably like, I, I don't know, in the fourth grade or third grade, like I was little. And the teacher was talking about things that good girls do, like they, they do what their mother says, and they help their mother, and they don't yell, they're not to their mother, right? All these things that good girls should do. Okay. And she said, oh, OMG, you're being sent to a younger grade. Ooh, I just saw that comment in school. Yes. Oh, how sometimes the punishment was being sent to a younger grade. Oh, that's so Also, shame. somebody asked for an example of what an unsustainable rule is. Sure. Can you think of any, like, were you thinking of anything that came to mind? Oh, lots of things. I mean, mm -hmm. I would... I, I mean, I have, I have teenagers in high school mm -hmm. and we chose their school beca because the rules made sense. We didn't yeah. want a school mm -hmm. where our, our kids would be forced to break them, like oh. the cell phone policies. And mm -hmm. um, because um, if, if they're punished for, for doing something that normal teenagers are doing, um, we just didn't feel like that was... Um, good for their emotional well-being yes yes or even there are um certain schools or institutions that put rules on parents that are unsustainable and this is not about me saying it's good or bad or whatever it is but for example um not allowing the parents to have certain um you know cell phone devices or whatever it is and then very often the parents will say well that's not sustainable so i'll have my legal phone and then my right. illegal phone right and then there's a sense of shame there. Like, see, I can't keep up with the rule of like the good people who don't have this phone. And right. Then they categorize themselves differently. Right. They categorize themselves differently, even if it's just privately. And that is there. It's in the family environment. Um, and, and, there, and even smaller examples of, and I don't know if it's still done, but children having to sit with their hands and the thing is low, so it folded. That, that's something so simple, but is it sustainable? You know, a child not being, not being allowed, you know, there's a rule you can't, if something falls down, you can't pick it up. It's something, it seems so simple, like, okay, whatever, they won't pick it up. But it's, when, when you're talking about a little kid, rules, 
and, and as they grow older, like you're talking about adolescents and you're evaluating schools based on, are they seeing these children as growing humans mm -hmm. and not as props in a classroom? And as they grow up, rules have to make sense and take into consideration, these are humans. And absolutely that makes the job of the teacher and principal in school a lot harder, but you're, you're working with humans. Like it's, it's not a joke. Right, they shouldn't um, feel shame for doing normal right. human things that Absolutely. other teenagers are doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, we could do a whole live on people sharing their shame experiences in school. There's a lot there. I could do a live just on mine. <laughs> no, <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just on yours. <laughs> yes. Ah. Uh. Yes, there's a lot. There. But I, but I had good defense mechanisms. I turned everything into a joke. Yeah, we all do. Like we all, something <laughs> comes up. We either start acting out or whatever it is, um, just to just to cope and be like, nah, I'm fine. Like it's it's okay. Um, because because shame, it's so difficult. Like it's 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 damaging. So I'm gonna share that story about when I was little and in school and the teacher was talking about, right, right, what it means to be a good girl and I'm listening and then she gave everyone a good tip, okay? And listen to this. Now, if you find yourself, let's say, and I'm gonna use the example of being chutzpedig to your mother, okay? Which, let's just do a big pause here and say, it is normal and natural and developmentally appropriate for children to sometimes be chutzpedig to their parents. It just is. Does that mean that we let our children be rogue animals and do and say whatever they want? No. It means though, that as soon as we accept this truth, right, that kids, it's part of their in separation and individuation, it's called, like trying out new things and trying to like, you know, test the boundary with their parent. It's normal, completely. And as parents, the, the job and opportunity over there is to respond to the need underneath the chutzpahdegness and then eventually, when the time is right, help them understand that there are respectful ways to speaking to people, what the benefits are of being respectful, model some conversations about what it would look like to get the same message across in a respectful way, right? There's room for that, but there's also, there has to be an understanding it's developmentally appropriate, okay? Um, and it's hard for a lot of people to take in, especially if they weren't allowed to be chutzpahdeg, right? Or like bring up, you know, say something that was like, you know, a little, you know, just testing. Um, but it's, it's developmentally appropriate. So that's just that. But this teacher was giving us little kids a tip. Okay, so listen to this. Now, she said, if we find ourselves being chutzpahdeg to our parent, all we needed to do was envision in our mind, think in our mind of her or our principal or, you know, someone in authority that we were kind of scared of. Just think in our mind and imagine that they were looking and seeing us being so chutzpahdig. Oh, I had that. Mm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Just think in your mind and, 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 and that'll, that'll make you stop. And I can't speak for anyone else in the class, but me, I always wanted to be a good girl, right? So I go home and then, of course, inevitably, at some point, I am chutzpahdik to my mother, right? Again, normal development, developmental stage. And, and, and then I remember what the teacher said and I try it, but it, it didn't work. It, it didn't work. Because I'm on a roll, okay? I'm being chutzpahdig. It's not going to stop. And all I have now to add to this role while this is going on, I have this vision of my teacher just standing there disapprovingly. Mm. Oh. So I didn't stop, and I just felt so much more shame. Now, the extras, and, and this is like, mainstream it's almost it was an unacceptable normal thing for her to do and some people teachers may eat or parents whatever it is may even use um god as the scare factor mm -hmm. i see you're nodding do you relate to that oh yeah yes mm -hmm. and and then 
God or Hashem becomes this really scary judging element. And it's, it's, it's so sad. It's very sad. Now, the exercise, OMG, the Jewish guilty conscious, it doesn't have to be that way. Someone, someone um, um, mentioned that. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. Now, the exercise I want us all to try is like this. Have two people in mind. I want you to envision one person who is maybe similar to the teacher that I described, right? Maybe an, an educator or a principal or someone who you remember being, you know, kind of a little like this. You know, that, that type, okay? So have that vision in mind. And then on the other hand, envision someone a little bit more, a lot more compassionate, understanding it could be a, a positive role model that you had in a teacher, someone who got it, someone who spent time and listened to you, a mentor, a therapist, a good friend that, you know, there's connection and understanding on both ends. So have these two in mind, okay? So hold them, one here, one here. Now envision, now in your mind, a scenario where you don't really like how you often respond to. So for example, um, <clears throat> certain ways that you have an argument with your spouse, right? You know, when we get to this topic, we always end up fighting in a certain way. And then two minutes later, I regret it, but I feel so much shame that I can't even apologize. And there's that, right? Or, you know, responding to a child in a certain way or a private behavior that you don't really like that you do. Like this could be anything. It could be anything in the realm of addiction or whatever it is that you kind of like end up feeling shame about, think of yourself engaging in that behavior, okay? You can close your eyes if you need to. It's happening right now, that situation, okay? Now, bring the first person into your mind as you're in that, you know, whatever, if you're fighting, yelling, whatever it is. that person there I think we're going in and out yeah it's back now it's back so having that scary or disapproving person there as you're going through the situation I guess I mean what I'm guessing for all of you is that it's only intensifying the shame that you're feeling like not only am I feeling not so good about what I'm doing but now it's like there's like this there's even more shame now put a pause on her or him and then envision the other person witnessing what's going on for you and what you might hear from that person, like the person that I'm envisioning, the, you know, the more the compassionate person might say something like, oh, wow, this is really difficult for you. You're stuck in this argument again. I know how much you hate being in this argument or, oh, I know how disappointed you are in yourself for responding to your child this way. And that, that person that you're envisioning, she's there or he's there and watching you go through this, but there's no shame. There's almost like, hmm, I get it. And then when you're back to yourself, if that person is still there in your mind, there might be a conversation about, that must have been really difficult. Like, hmm, do, should we go through some ideas of how you can do it differently? Should we reach out and see if there's any support that we need to put in place? That is the difference between shame and guilt, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Shame is that disapproving, attacking. It has that, you know, like a scary, just smirking off even face. And it doesn't help. It doesn't help. It just doesn't, right? Even if you might stop the behavior for one second or for one minute or for one day because, you know, the shame is just there, it's not sustainable. When we talk about sustainable rules, right? If there are stuff we want to put in place for ourselves, having them rooted in shame is not sustainable. It's not. But having- but dieting is also- Oh amazing. my gosh. Yes. Oh, I just, I recorded a podcast today with uh, Mind Over Munchies about shame and dieting and how they kind of, you know, come together in this never ending loop, right? If diets worked, We'd all be our desired weight. It doesn't work because it's rooted in shame. It's rooted, in, it's rooted yeah. in shame about our body and shame about what we look like and shame. Uh, shame is so much deeper. It's about what our body represents. It's, and guess what? It doesn't work. 
it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And we know it. But we kind of like stay attached to it. There's an illusion of control when we finally kind of like are like, okay, shame, yes, I'm gonna stop. And there's this illusion that yes, I can really stop. The shame is gonna motivate me. And it's like, okay, hmm, yeah, I'll, I'll watch. Yeah, and it'll take a week or two and then you're back at it. Not because you're a failure, but because shame will fail you, mm -hmm. right? Whereas guilt is kind of like this compassionate team player. It's like, hey, hey, I get you. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna put it in place? Now, something interesting, is today is National No Diet Day. Yes, good. Um, now, something interesting that there's two things that I wanna talk about with, with shame and guilt and like, um, ooh, let me see where I wanna go. Um, okay, I'm gonna go in this direction and then see if there's time to go talk about the other thing. But now the thing with shame, shame is very smart, okay? And shame has this amazing ability to dress up as other things. It has like this closet and it, it has like little, imagine shame, like whether it's huge for you or a tiny little being for you, but imagine whatever it is, if it's a huge thing, then it has a tremendous closet. If it's tiny, it has this little closet that it goes to and it dresses up as different things. And then it'll, it's gonna try to like, it, it's really cool, but it's gonna try to fool you. So for example, Something very simple is shame might dress up as motivation, right? Mm -hmm. It's really shame. It's your shame. But it might dress, it might, it puts on this little suit and, and this little hat and it just comes and it knocks and it says, hey, no, this is not shame. I'm motivating you. See, I'm going to get you to the gym. I'm, I'm going to get you to, to eat salad. You know, I'm, I'm here. I'm going to help you. And, and we might get fooled for a second because it's wearing this really cool suit and it's wearing this hat and it's like, it's really telling us to do these really positive things, right? Going to the gym, working out is so healthy and it gives us all this information, right? It's an educated little thing. And it tells us like, yes, going to the gym. See, our doctor even said that we have to do it. And, and, it, just, and, it, and it keeps giving us information. And for a little bit, we might even get fooled and we put on our gym clothes and we pack our bag and we, we go to the gym. But then after a couple of days of doing this, if we feel that shame, hangover, or we feel really terrible about like, oh, oh my gosh, see I'm at the gym and there's that other person who's so gorgeous and oh, ugh, and, and we walk out like, uh, hmm, maybe it was shame dressed up as motivation. Or for example, um, Shame can dress up, when we're talking about dieting, right? It can dress up as intuitive eating. Now, I, I, it's hard to gauge if people know what intuitive eating is. I mean, it's pretty... We, we, have, a, uh, we have a live on intuitive eating with, oh, yeah. uh, with that Sivy Pill Nourish Crate. Mm. Um, and it didn't record. I, I wasn't able to record it, so she's coming back in like a month. So if anyone's interested in intuitive okay. eating... So yeah, intuitive oh. eating is, is um, a really healthy approach to to food and body, I guess. Is, is, I mean, it, <laughs> there's a lot more, but it's very healthy. However, if shame has a costume or an outfit that looks like intuitive eating, it's going to give you all the intuitive eating words and the buzzwords, and it's going to tell you, oh, you know, an intuitive eater doesn't doesn't just you know eat that an intuitive eater would know if their body is hungry and it starts giving you and then for a second you might think like oh yeah I'm, I'm avoiding this or that or I'm doing this or that because now I'm an intuitive eater and it's like no shame just found a new way to wiggle itself into mm -hmm. your brain a oh, rock solid itself has, uh, says it's like the inner critic um if is shame is the inner critic let's see Yeah, I mean, the inner critic uses shame. I, I think, can we describe it as one and the same? I wonder about that. To me, it almost feels like the inner critic uses shame because uh, a lot of people understand the inner critic almost as the inner parent. Um, and that's a little demonizing to the parent because when we're children, we interject the entire parent, right? Meaning we take them in and we have a little um, representative of our parent um, within us. 
So they give us what, you know, let's say if a parent did a lot of great things, like they were super encouraging and they were super, you know, they're like, hey, you got this, like you can do this. We still have that part of our parent, but we also have the critical part of the parent living on in us. Um, so that's what I, and, and that part uses shame a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the way I see it is the inner critic versus the healthy voice or the soul voice. I hear that. Yeah, I can see how you could conceptualize it like that. That's what Rock Sol itself is saying. Mm -hmm. um, I can see it. I can see it being conceptualized that way. Absolutely. I guess it just uh, it, it. I guess it just depends on the individual with how their inner critic sounds, right? Right. Like right. What, what how... tactics the inner critic uses. Right. Or even, I mean, when it comes to terminology, <laughs> there are a lot of times that people that I work with will connect to a certain terminology better than they do with another. So they might connect with, let's say, an inner critic versus a soul voice better than if we were talking about shame versus guilt. Mm -hmm. So like, they might just connect with that better, so we go with that. Um, but there's a lot to take apart in each of these. I mean, these are just so, they're, they're delicious concepts <laughs> to talk about. Um, let's see, interesting. I guess I see the inner critic as a defense mechanism we develop. Again, what I, this is a bigger topic because there's a lot that I want to talk about when it comes to defense mechanisms and inner critic. Um, so yeah, there's, there's too much to kind of just say it in one sentence, but I'm going to say that there are a lot of ways that we can conceptualize these different elements. And then there's also, there are also connecting factors in all of them. Um, yeah, maybe we could do another live on defense mechanisms. They're fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to scroll up and see if there are any questions or comments that catch my eye. You could do the same if there's anything that um, came up or any questions that you have. Well, I, I wrote a few questions down. Oh. And I think you also had a few that you yes. that, that came in to you. Um, Oh, so there was one question that came in. How do you know when you're doing enough? Like, uh, like when the voice inside your head says, come on, you can do better, get up and do more. Um, like, how do you know if it's, if it's um, a cop out or, or, or re whether you really could do more? So the question is, um, like, when you hear this, uh, the voice of like, Hold on, how do I get the comments <clears throat> to go in? So when you hear the voice of like, oh, come on, you could like wondering. Mm. What, what I'm understanding the question to be is when I hear this voice that's motivating me or whatever it is, how do I know if it's real, like a motivator or if it's shame dressed up mm -hmm. as the motivator? Is that? Yeah, like, like how could you, like, because sometimes, you know, you're, um, oh, you can see in the background, like my, my Rocky poster behind me. Yeah. So, 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 you know, you get like, you know, that was always like my vision, like of like, come on. Yeah. You could, you could get up one more round, but like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it, it like, like, how do you know the difference between healthy motivation and shame? Okay. So one of the things that comes to mind is when you hear that voice, what does it sound like? Is it angry and punishing or is it gentle and motivating? So that's one thing. And it takes time for us to be able to tune into our bodies and to understand the parts of us and what their voices sound like, right? So mm -hmm. that's just a very basic thing. Like when you hear that voice telling you, you could do it, you could do it. When you ask yourself honestly, yourself, when that voice kind of goes away, can I do more? If the answer is yes, but honestly, like don't fool yourself because then like, who, like, okay, you're fooling yourself. But if the answer honestly is, yeah, I could do more. I'm just lazy right now or I don't want to or that's too hard or I want, I need a break. No, I need a break means no, I can't do more or um, I, I'd rather not. Then you know like, okay, I can do more, but I, I'm not there right now. Or if the, the answer might be, if you ans ask yourself honestly, the answer might be, no, I'm, I'm done. Like, no, sorry, I, I can't. Right. And then you, then you ask that voice to be like, hey, motivator, I know your shame, dressed up as motivator. Um, I'm going to ask you to 
you know, take a walk, um, read a book, have some tea, because I, I, I'm not up for this right now. Mm -hmm. Just with, and it's that's not a really that. hard one that because from personal experience that like just differentiating mm -hmm. that was a good question that came in, but I know from from personal experience that I I had no idea what you know like when you when you ha host like tons of guests and mm -hmm. and you're trying to parent and you're trying to to work like and and like and then you're taking side projects and this chesed and blah, 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 like and and you know kind of well this person was able to manage it well why can't i manage it what's wrong with me you know why can't i manage it like right. come on you could do it you could do it you're just as capable right but even then, there like if you're comparing yourself to another person that's already a red flag that is <laughs> probably shame and it's not always about comparing yourself to another person. I know it's, it's sometimes, sometimes it's like super internal stuff. Um, <clears throat> but one huge indicator, and it's like, oh, Javi could do it. They could do it. Their family could do it. Like, why should I not be able to? And that's a little red flag of like, maybe it's shame. Yeah, you have no idea what Javi's going through. And even if she has it all together <laughs> and she's superwoman, great. I'm not Javi. Right? Like, sometimes we think that we have to, you know, know that, oh, probably behind the scenes and behind closed doors, the other person is suffering. Maybe they're, I don't know, maybe their life is great. That doesn't really matter, though. Like, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Okay, their life rocks. Great. But this is about me. Right? So they're able to host the world. Great. Can I? And then you have to listen to the honest answer, though. Because, again, we're, we can fool ourselves. No one will know. It's our own personal process. It just won't feel good. It just won't feel right. good. But if we're really honest with ourselves, it's like, hey, can I do more? If the answer is yes, by all means. If you have the right support and if you know how to take care of yourself and you know how to make sure to prioritize whatever it is that you want to prioritize, amazing. Do it. Be Javi. But if, if the answer when you ask yourself, can I do more, is a gentle, tired no. It might behoove you to listen to that. Or I don't want to do more anymore. Right, <laughs> absolutely. It's like, no, I can't because I don't want to. Great. And I want to snuggle with my kid in right. bed, read a book, you know. Right. You know? And that's, right, and that's what stuff, like if there, are, if there are times, and here's just a big disclaimer to put out there, if there are times that you find yourself answering no right to this question can i do more or can i do what i need to do to basic um life activities so for example um being there for yourself with uh, you know daily living stuff personal hygiene feeding yourself feeding your children then you know there might be a need if you find yourself again and again saying like no like oh i can't i can't that might be that shame and depression are kind of linking their hands um, and in that situation, I would always say, like, it's super important to reach out to someone, a mental yeah. health professional, because once depression joins the picture, um, d depression and shame are super close buddies. Like, they really, and depression and addiction also, like, they really, they speak the same language, like, they really get each other. And it, it could become pretty dangerous. Like, depression, you know, it, it's not something that you could just, like, get over or something that you could self-care your way out of. Um, that's just something that must be- And anxiety, uh, um, uh, Abigail just said that that's a good one, yeah. Let's hear it, hold on. Ooh, I'm up at the comments. Was also, so why is shame bad if it works? Let's see, hold on. Why is shame bad if it works? Okay, lay up. I'm gonna challenge you. Actually, I'm gonna tell you, you can't answer, because like, the, but you can't. Okay, wait a second. It works short term and you know what it does work it really does short term it works so well anyone who's ever been on let's say a diet knows that shame works short term okay it works until you cheat it works until you i'm just gonna treat myself and no one will know and i'm gonna hide the wrapper in the garbage it works until then and guess what? It works right afterwards also. Like it starts its cycle again. So 
the reason, part of the reason why we stay so attached to shame is because it gives us the illusion of control, right? If I harness the shame, if I use the shame, and you know, things are gonna change and things are gonna get better. And guess what? It, things are gonna change short term. Things don't get better though. Like shame, shame is not an ingredient in transformation, in evolvement. It's not, right? It kind of, it, it, but it's like, you know, a car that doesn't have gas anymore, right? If you push down really hard on the gas pedal, right? Maybe it'll surge forward a little bit and guess what? The car moves, but it's like, yeah, no, it's not gonna take you where you need to go because that's just, it's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. However, if you fuel your car, yourself, your vessel of, of the human that you are with compassion, understanding, curiosity, these are hard things to come by. Like they're not easy, especially if we weren't showered with it. <clears throat> Sorry, showered with it as little humans. If we weren't showered with these things as kids, they're very difficult to just kind of have. We have to work at it. But these are the ingredients that actually lead to long lasting change. So if you're in the game for short term, quick fix, maybe change for a little while, shame can help again shame works really hard it has an entire closet of these things that it dresses up as like it really mm -hmm. it works really hard to kind of like show that it can help and it, it sometimes does a good job short term but if you're invested in the long game and the long term change and transformation it's not shame that's going to do it right it's like i said compassion curiosity wondering you know learning about yourself, learning about your story, about your narrative. Who are you? What, what, pre like, what made you into who you are? Why do you have the difficulties that you do? And the why is not a judgmental why, it's a wondering why. Um, those are the things, the ingredients for long-term change. So it depends on what game you're in. And, and then there's different therapies once you, you know, the, like, uh, like I, I know um, CBT is, is an, DBT and you, you do all the um, like dra drama therapy. You, yes. You, yeah. So um, I, right. So I personally don't do um, CBT. Um, yeah. It's not, no, it's not the, the therapy intervention that I use. Um, but I very much focus on acknowledging shame when it enters the room and then sometimes using psychodrama techniques. Hi, Yeti. Sometimes using psychodrama techniques we will bring shame into the room and almost like use something to personify it. You know, we might, if it's group work, we might have a person personifying your shame and then you can have a conversation with your shame. You can reverse roles with your shame so you can speak from the shame part. Um, there's so much that we do in therapy around it. And it's only if we acknowledge it, meet it, talk to it in whatever way works that we can understand A, why it's sticking around, B, how it thinks it's helping us, C, how old it thinks we are. Sometimes shame mm -hmm. really thinks we're a little kid who needs to be shamed into submission because otherwise mommy won't love us. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, don't worry, I'm gonna take care of everything. See, you're gonna be a good girl and mommy's gonna love you. So I, it, I don't know, that could be one example, right? But shame has its own like personality, its own reasoning for sticking around. And it's only when we acknowledge that it's not really helping us long-term that we can start leaning towards curiosity, compassion, wondering, investing in ourselves and all of that. Um, Lady Weeder asks, you do psychodrama with kids? Yes, modified. So it's not like psychodrama would look like with a group of adults. Um, but I definitely incorporate psychodramatic techniques. Absolutely. I mean, it's the, the a modality and therapy that I deeply, deeply connected with um, and love it. It does tremendous work um, for trauma and trauma that breeds shame and all of that. It's fantastic work. Um, that's actually, that's, that's the way that I do the deep dive course. Like I said earlier, it's not me sitting there and talking to you. It's us working together. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that Brene emphasizes is uh, that shame can't live when you speak it, when, yes. you, when you call it out. Yes. Shame not only that, right, that um, I don't have the words right now in my mind, but it's that not, it's, 
I think it's something about when you share your story with a compassionate listener, shame cannot survive or something like that. It's yes, when you're sitting with a person, a therapist, a friend, um, and, and again, a friend doesn't take the place of a therapist, the therapist doesn't take the place of a friend, but whatever supportive person you have there and you are able to share your story and your story is valid no matter how meh it is or no matter how like, oh, it's not so bad, other people had it worse, irrelevant. Your story is your story. It made you into who you are. And sitting with a, comp a compassionate other, with an enlightened witness and telling your story and being received in a safe way is so healing. And shame, it's, it, it just doesn't, it almost like stops having a reason to stick around, at least for those couple of moments, at least for that moment in time, it doesn't really have a role. Because we're able to kind of tell shame like, hey, this is, this is amazing. Like this, this feels okay. And shame, it just kind of like takes a nap or like wanders off for a walk because it's like, oh, I'm taking care of myself. I'm being received. There's someone who's listening, someone who's seeing me. That's, that's tremendously healing. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Deeply healing. And I guess, um, I guess you learn the tools when, when you're doing the psychodrama, you're learning the tools so so first you're doing it with a group, but then you kind of learn the, how your inner dialogue should sound also, right? Right, exactly. It gives you a template for how, exactly, for how your inner dialogue could sound. Um, it's not even about how it should sound, because you're going to tweak it depending on who you are as a person, but it's, it's this opening of wow, there's another way that I could be responded to. There's another way that I can be, another way that I can exist. And even people who don't do group work, even people who do individual work, the way that I respond to them and the way that I am with them in the room is a modeling of what it can look like eventually for them to be with themselves, for them to respond to themselves, for them to exist within their own bodies. So even when it's not in a group, there's always the modeling going on of what it's like to be non-judgmentally, always acceptingly received, and then working on whatever comes up um, in, a, in a compassionate way. And when you said the word should, it reminded me of... Um, just this little thing that, that came up in some of the work that I was doing, um, where should, the word should, oh, I should have done that, I shouldn't have, should, is very often an indicator, oops, sorry, I'm right here, my battery's low. Um, it's at 20%, so we're good. Um, is often an indicator that shame is right around the corner holding hands with mm. should. Should and shame, they're twin sisters or best friends. They love each other. They go well together. And when shame wants to use a little trick and wants to make you believe that it's you who wants to do the thing that shame wants you to do, it's, it puts in an I should. Oh, I should have. Oh, I should have done this. Oh, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. Oh, I shouldn't have watched that. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Guess what? Like when, when, with a should, 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 do you ever find yourself like actually making change? Again, maybe short term, not long lasting. But the second you tweak even one where it's like, oh, could I have done that differently? So A, you turned it into a question. Question curiosity always is helpful. It's just, I, mean, I love questions. I love like curiosity. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's so open and freeing, right? So A, you turned it into a question, and B, you went from should to could. Could mm -hmm. is so empowering. Should is shaming. Mm -hmm. Could is this empowering, oh, I could have. Oh, what could I do? It's, it's limitless. It's like, it's this, ama it opens this amazing, just well of possibilities, and then you can choose what you'd like to do. Could you apologize? Could you put something else in place? Could you reach out for help? I don't know. Because once you ask the question, like the answers come to you. It may take some time, especially the first couple of times that you try these things. It can seem foreign. And shame doesn't like when we start owning our power. Mm -hmm. So it might increase, right? And it might yell even more. And it might shame you for trying to 
let's say switch it to a question, it might laugh at your face. But um, Leia, Leia there, um, I, I like what she said is, is it possible to be that positive person for everyone else, but still work in progress for yourself? Yes, I wonder about what you mean with that, that positive person, like the encouraging person. Like that probably, is that what you understood you, the question? Do you mean like that perfect person for everyone mm. else, but work in progress for yourself? I mean, I would say when I think about a work in progress, my understanding of humans are that that's what we are. It's almost like a, it's, it's synonymous to the word human is work in progress. Like, is anyone ever perfectly positive or perfectly perfect? I, I haven't met one yet like a, a perfect person. So the gifts, to, the gifts of imperfection. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's sometimes that argument of like, uh, is there is there no such thing as a perfect person? Or do we um, kind of ascribe to the belief that everyone is inherently perfect? I don't know. Perfect is a big word. Um, to me, when we think about the word work in progress, to me, that feels like it feels synonymous to being human. Like that's, it's it just, it's part of being human. We're perfectly imperfect. Okay. <laughs> That's one way to kind of link the two. Yeah. It's actually fun to embrace imperfection. Especially yeah. when you didn't even know that you're a perfectionist and then you're like, yeah, whatever. Like, yeah. And it's not, and you said that you spoke about that earlier of like, you kind of learning like, oh, oh, wow, I'm a perfectionist apparently. And then what came of that, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it was like, eye-opening yeah learning new things about ourselves with with like compassion and curiosity is just it's a beautiful um thing to experience um i'm looking at other questions encouraging and non-shaming children's past etc but inner voice is not hold on is that on the bottom like a question oh okay i think i understand what she's trying to say um that that you're that you're basically a a good model for growth pro like growth and work in progress for everybody else but your inner voice is is shaming and not good is so, that what you mean yeah so i i understand that now like what what leia added is that what she means I, it looks it sounds like um and you can correct it leia if, if we didn't get it but yeah so there's absolutely this idea of like learning skills, right? And being able to say the right words to our children, to our spouse or whatever it is, but then internally feeling like it's not really, I can't say it to myself. I can say it to other people, but I can't say it to myself. So there's a couple of things. First, it's good when we apply skills, even though we can't apply it to ourselves, but that when we start applying it to others, like it's, it's a good place to start. But especially when it comes to children, um, as anyone really, but children can be deeply affected by this. If our energy is still full of shame, it will come across in some way or another. So that's just something to keep in mind. Now, if you are finding that you're able to at least say the words, like encouraging non-shaming words to other people, but you're, it's, you're not able to apply it to yourself, usually that would indicate that there's some kind of something Right? Like you pointed it out, Leah, when you said the inner voice is not. I would wonder more about what the inner voice is. Like, what am I holding on to? What's getting in the way? Is it relational trauma with a parent? Is it some kind of um, uh, religious trauma? Like, meaning like being told that someone is, you know, like some kind of scary thing that kind of is sticking with you. Um, there's usually something that's getting, obviously, there's something that's getting in the way. And as a therapist, I see that a lot. And when we start going into it, it's, it's not the same for any two people, the thing that's getting in the way. But obviously there's something there and something that's worth being looked at. Um, so that's also, what- kids, I think kids really do pick up. I, I mean, maybe you could, maybe you could mm -hmm. take it for your, for your spouse or, mm. or for, for your coworkers. But I really think that kids really pick up your insecurities and they, they pick up on uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I not yeah, not even insecurities because like being in like showing insecurities and being open about them is actually super like healthy for children to see like you know oh mommy I'm actually not sure if I know how to do this mm, right, let's right. try together but if the insecurity is surrounded by shame right layers and layers of shame and we don't we don't acknowledge it we don't say it out loud 
what happens then is yes, children pick up on the energy. Even a connected couple, right? If we're talking about spouses, if the spouse is connecting, the other spouse will also pick up on it. And it depends on the safety of the relationship if, if the other spouse will be able to say something um, or will kind of feel like they have to keep it quiet. Um, and that's a whole other realm. But absolutely, like our, the energy that we give off um, definitely plays a role, even if we're saying all the right words, which is why it's important to acknowledge if we have a blockage and then think about how we want to approach that. Yeah. And I'm looking at other questions that people sent in. Oh, the, the, um, can we talk, talk about Instagram making girls feel ugly and should someone get off of Instagram if they feel that way? Um, I think that's like a whole other topic. That... Yeah. And there I would before, I mean, Rachel Tuchman did a, a fantastic live this past weekend, I think on Matzah Shabbos, um, with Esther Schwartz. So mm -hmm. what I would highly recommend for that question, and that's just the launching pad, kind of, for the, the many conversations we can have around that. But um, they, they both together spoke about um, social media and a lot of things related to it. It's on Rachel's... Um, YouTube. 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 Also, yeah. Rachel has another one about body image. She oh, she does. She oh, I did. didn't know that. It's a really good one that she did a few months ago on body image. Oh, that's great. Um, and all of them are on YouTube. So you can check that out. Oh, yeah, I want to go check it out. Because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot to be said about that and that it does tie into um, body shame and not only body shame, but how we were spoken to about our bodies um it ties into sexuality a lot and how we were allowed to express ourselves or experience ourselves in that way um how our body was used by others like it's a very extensive complex topic um and it's not that social media is bad or instagram is bad but it's that social media kind of throws it at your face like any insecurities or unprocessed trauma around these issues, um, Instagram is a great place for you to kind of have it thrown at you and been like, hey, um, you have to deal with this because mm -hmm. I'm not going to be quiet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hi, Diddy. My cousin coming to say hi. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's a big topic. So definitely recommend that live. Um, are there any qu other questions that you're seeing? I'm, I'm just scrolling now. You're scrolling? Okay. Um, um, somebody asked, can you save this? I will definitely try. 95% of the time it works. So I really hope it works this time. <laughs> oh, so like you have to like catch it at the last minute? Yeah. Okay. So I've never, uh, actually, I've never done a live on my own page. Um, so I, I haven't yet come across that, that issue. Well, no, like when the, when I did with, um, with Nourish Kite, so the way that it normally is, is you X out and you click on it and, um, and it asks if you want to save, but it didn't do that. It just kind of like shorted out. Oh, so it totally lost it. It didn't even oh, save for the 24 hours. Oh, it's, that sucks. I know. I know. But it's okay because she's coming back. And it'll be okay. better than the last one even. Oh, okay. she was great. Okay. That's great. When is uh, that next week? No, it's not next week. It's like next month, I think. Next I have month. to look at the schedule. Okay. Um, but, but, um, but yeah, no, this, um, Oh, Muffins and Moms Parenting just said hi. She oh. also, we did a live with with them towards the beginning.